Welcome to the series of lectures on Bangladesh Paradox, decoding the Bangladesh Paradox. Over a series of lectures, we would like to understand what the paradox is and how we might resolve it, if we might resolve it. It's a research agenda. At the moment, it's an agenda because I actually have not done most of this work myself. The aim is to actually do the work as much as possible and then explore the results together through these lectures. A secondary aim is understanding, better understanding the concept of economic growth and relate, related economic ideas so that next time you read or hear um, about these issues, you might be better informed. It's an experiment of sorts because, well, because we're going to do the research as we go along, so we don't know what we'll find. And also because this whole concept of coffee house, these, these videos are at least to me new and we don't know where it will go. I'm sure it will go somewhere good. So welcome to the journey. Stick around and let's see where we go. Okay, first things first. What exactly is the paradox? The paradox is not why Bangladesh has been growing so fast. 6%, 7%, whatever numbers that government publishes. That's not the paradox. Rather, the paradox is that despite still being a relatively poor country, Bangladesh has achieved rather impressive um, records in human development, in, in standard of living. That table that I've got, this, this is from a 2012 Economist article. It shows that despite being poorer than India and Pakistan, our two neighbors, Bangladesh has better life expectancy or um, health statistics. How have we achieved that? That's the question. That's the paradox. How might we go and answer this? Well, the first thing to ask is, is it really a paradox? Maybe it's not. Maybe we are looking at the wrong countries as our comparator, as our benchmark. Maybe Bangladesh should not be compared with India and Pakistan. Maybe we should be compared with some other set of countries. Or maybe we should be compared with um, provinces and states of those countries. That's one avenue. A different avenue or a related avenue there is that maybe Bangladesh is the normal. It's India and Pakistan which are abnormal in that maybe maybe it's those countries that are underperforming relative to their GDP. Maybe they uh, maybe that's the issue. So firstly, we would want to do a proper comparison. An alternative explanation might be that Bangladesh is actually richer than we think it is. We have a very large informal economy, unmeasured economy, and, and maybe that's the issue. Maybe our measured GDP per capita is actually too low. Or maybe that it's the GDP that's fine. It's the, um, it's the health statistics that's too rosy. Maybe we're overestimating our human development. So any research agenda, we'll start with that. So that's our rule first look. Assume that for now, this economics, so assume for now that we find that those things are actually all right and that, that there actually is a paradox. What next? Obviously, the next place to look at is the economic growth process. 
just because just because Bangladesh does better given its GDP does not make GDP irrelevant. Quite the contrary. Bangladesh was a wretchedly poor place until the 80s. It's not a coincidence that things started getting better as the economy started getting better, improving. Right? So we would want to know what about our GDP growth process that may have contributed to the development in a relatively favorable manner. From a structural change perspective, we know that agriculture's share of the economy has shrunk, that of manufacturing has risen, and services sectors have become more productive. From a growth accounting perspective, we know that there has been favorable demographic transition, and female workforce, workplace participation has help, helped, but also that there has been improvement in multi-factor production. So far, this sounds like a straightforward East Asian, Southeast Asian growth story of um, people coming from farms to factories, export-driven, manufacturing-driven growth, except in Bangladesh's case, unlike in, in, in other Asian countries, investment has not picked up. Investment to GDP ratio is relatively low, and we would like to understand that. We would like to understand what's causing that and what might the implications be. Now, flip side of investment being relatively low compared with GDP is that, that consumption has held up well. And that's something we would like to understand better. We would like to understand the microeconomics of this here. Um, would like to understand how remittance and um, female income play into that. And I'm not aware of any um, in-depth research in this front, so story here will be somewhat speculative. We'll see where we go. Once we have understood the growth process a bit better, we would like to understand where did that growth go. So we'd like to look at the income side of GDP. We would like to understand the returns to capital and labor, which would inevitably lead to a discussion on political economy. And then finally, we would like to understand what happened beyond growth. After all, that is what the paradox is all about, that there has been a process of growth, there has been a process of improvement in GDP, and the development outcome of that has been beyond what you might expect from growth. Suspects are usual, green revolution, demography, women, NGOs, but also what I would call Dhaka consensus, that there is a concerted effort by our elites to never repeat the uh, events of the early 70s famines and destitution. So we'd like to understand all of this. What next? I propose a lecture on each of these components, some jargons, some um, explanations, some charts, some data, to unpack this story. Obviously, I have not given you any answers at all in this lecture. This is just whet your appetite. Um, stick around, and hopefully we'll get something in time. Thank you.